beginning. Alrighty, any questions about esophagus, peristalsis? I'm not gonna go into too much detail of peristalsis because you don't really need it for this lesson. Um, as you get a little bit deeper into biology in first and second year university, you'll learn a bit more about peristalsis and why it's so important, but just have to know for now that it's an involuntary contraction of muscles and it moves things throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Check my emails. <laughs> And once again, thank you to those of you using the check marks. Help me to let me know that you're able to move on and that you get this stuff for the most part and you have no real questions just yet. Again, if you have a question later on, totally acceptable, totally understandable. Happy to answer any and all questions at any point, really. Um, but yeah, just let me know and I'm more than happy to do so. Man, long hair is annoying, folks. I don't know how y'all with longer hair do it all the time. Gets in the way, gets everywhere. Oh my God. All righty. Let's take a look at the stomach. So the stomach, it is a muscular organ for lack of a better word. There it is. And there's a lot of things going on in the stomach. Okay. A lot of things going on in the stomach. Mainly, mainly, oops, that's not what I wanted mainly the mechanical digestion of food. I'll talk a little bit more about it with regards to the structures that we'll look at as we move through the stomach, but it's a bit of a misnomer or a bit of a, um, a misunderstanding with regards to what the stomach does. Most people are like, yeah, the stomach is where food is digested. Well, it's a big part of the digestion process, but in reality, it's not really doing too much digestion. So it's J-shaped, it is muscular, and it is responsible for accepting and holding that partially digested food. And it does so by way of what's called sphincters. A sphincter is a circular muscle that can contract or open based on what it needs to do. So your stomach sphincter at the top by the esophagus, it is contracted when it is not receiving food. And it's pretty great in this context because it keeps things in the stomach that needs to stay there, like stomach acids, juices, digested food, partially digested food, what have you. But it's also good at receiving signals from the esophagus. As peristalsis is happening, the esophagus sends a message to the stomach sphincter that connects to the esophagus. And it says, hey, I got food incoming. And the stomach goes, okay, boss. And it opens up the sphincter to allow that food to go through. So it relaxes and opens that sphincter which allows for food to go through, okay? So that's the general introductory component to the stomach. We're gonna look at some aspects with regards to, um, with regards to function. We're gonna look at some aspects with regards to what goes on in the stomach. And most importantly, we're gonna spend some time talking about, uh oh, what did I just do? That's not what I wanted, there we go. With regards to the importance of the stomach, because there are a lot of key components to the stomach that are important for digestion later on. And I'll talk about those in just a second after you finish getting this note down. All righty. Okay, any questions about the general introductory about the shape of the stomach or the overall idea of sphincters? What do you mean close a gap? Yes, so the muscle is like this normally, okay? I don't know if you can see, I can see the camera. The muscle is like this. It can contract to do this, to close that gap. This is a gap, right? This is a gap here. It can close to close the gap or it can open to make a gap. 
And that allows food to go in or to stay, in, to, to go into the stomach or to, to, um, to enter the stomach. Yes. All righty. So we're going to look at all the different structures and layers in the stomach now. And there's five main structures or layers that we're going to take into consideration again, right? And when you think about uh, all of the assessments we're going to have over the next couple of weeks, this is information that you're going to need to have some general idea about, okay? So the anatomy of the stomach, you're definitely going to have to know. Anatomy of the mouth, definitely going to have to know. Any of those charts that I talked about over the last two days, even the last three or four days, definitely going to have to, you know, have an idea of how and what they are there. So a lot of information to take in, but Again, contextually, I think it will be a little bit easier than some of the other ideas because of how connected it is to what we do and what we know. So the first is the gastroesophageal or cardiac sphincter. This is going to relax to allow the bolus into the stomach. So this is right at the top. This is the first structure of the stomach and it's connected to that esophagus and it's going to relax to allow the bolus in. So again, you chew your food, mm, delicious bread. Chew, 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 swallow. Esophagus sends that bolus down. Once it gets to that gastroesophageal sphincter or the first sphincter at the top of the stomach, that sphincter is going to relax. It's going to open and allow that bolus into the stomach. But it also will continue or it will also stay contracted once there is food inside. Now, if you've ever had heartburn before, if you've ever had heartburn before, it's because the gastroesophageal or cardiac sphincter, and this is a way for you to remember it, right? Gastroesophageal or cardiac sphincter, cardiac sphincter. If you've ever had heartburn before, that's because this sphincter is a little bit open when it shouldn't be. I don't know if you can see that. And some of the stomach acid that's inside of our, our, our stomachs can actually come up a little bit and it can cause that irritation that we call heartburn. Okay, so it relaxes to allow food in, contracts to keep that bolus in there or that partially digested food in the stomach. And if there are any issues with that gastroesophageal sphincter, that's where heartburn can come from. All righty. Questions? Uh, the sphincter is at the top of the stomach. So hold on, let me, um, let me show you the diagram. Yeah, I got to clear my screen off though, because all my other stuff is in the way a little. There we go. Okay, one second. I'll reshare my screen in just a second. The left hand is tricky. All right. So the gastroesophageal layer, let me highlight it for y'all right there in orange. So it's that sphincter that connects the esophagus to the stomach. Does it open if we throw up? Yep. So reverse peristalsis or vomiting is when the stomach contents for the most part uh, need to be voided due to muscle contractions, being sick, queasy, nauseous, et cetera. Uh, the muscle contracts in the opposite direction for lack of a better word. And the, uh, esophageal cardiac or cardiac sphincter opens up, reverse peristalsis, the same motion that brings the food down uh, happens, but in the reverse direction and uh, you vomit. So it's exactly the exact same motions of muscle, just in the opposite direction. And instead of opening to let bolus into the stomach, it opens to let the stomach contents out. All righty, let's take a look at the next component, the next structure. This is the mucosa layer. 
This is the innermost layer, the most innermost stomach facing or content facing layer. So this layer is exposed to the external environment because it is the first layer that is making contact with the bolus, with everything in the stomach. Now, these are the cells that make gastric juices. I'll talk more about gastric juices in a bit, but these gastric juices are going to be crucial for the later on digestion components that we talk about in our small intestine. Because like I said earlier, the common misconception here is that digestion happens in the stomach. It does not. The real event, the main digestion event of the breaking down and absorption of nutrients, that all happens in your small intestine, specifically at the beginning of your small intestine. And again, we'll cover more of that on Monday when we look at the intestines, but it's crucial for you to know that this mucosa layer, it without it, digestion would be absolutely next to impossible. This makes gastric juices, which I'll cover later on, but this, the gastric juices are what allow for that digestion and absorption to happen in our small intestine. Okay, questions with regards to... Um, the mucosa layer or the innermost layer. Okay, check marks abound, check marks abound. All right, folks, let's take a look at the next layer then, which is the submucosa layer. The submucosa layer is the middle layer. It's the middle layer. And this is what contains all the blood vessels and nerves that really help us in our day-to-day -day life because it helps us to feel full. It tells us when we're hungry. It tells us if we have stomach cramps, if the muscle is experiencing any cramping, if there's something in the stomach that doesn't necessarily jive with us, all of those signal detection and nerve endings is going to be in that submucosa layer. Sub, again, our Latin prefixes, sub meaning below, submucosa. So the innermost layer is the mucosa. The submucosa is the layer below it. And it's in the middle in between the this submucosa or the mucosa layer and our third layer that we'll look at later on. But again, it contains blood vessels. It contains the nerves. So the blood vessels supply the muscle with nutrients and the nerves tell us when we're full, hungry, stomach's upset, stomach's cramping, um, didn't enjoy whatever we ate, not feeling it. All of those emotions, for lack of a better word, emotions, all of those sensations and feelings, this is where that comes from, that submucosa layer. So anytime you're hungry, you go, oh, submucosa, working hard over there. And it'll go, yep, go get a snack. So submucosa layer, sub below the mucosa layer. So if you could look at it as like a diagram, right? I always like to make a little diagram for my students in the context of, this is, this is the, oh, there we go. Imagine this J-shaped box as your stomach, okay? Imagine this J-shaped box as your stomach. That's a terrible drawing, but whatever. You get the gist of it. So this is the inside of your stomach. This is the inside of your stomach. Beep. Inside, okay? And then the brown or the burgundy, sorry, that I did, that is, here, I'll just do, 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 do ba, 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 be, the mucosa layer. Oh, oh, there, mucosa, okay? And then, and then we'll do red. That's the submucosa. So see how it's, when I say below, what I mean to say is, think of the inside as the top part, right? Think of the inside as the top part. Below that mucosa, below that mucosa is the submucosa layer. Okay? Does that make sense with what I mean by that? The inside is considered the top. And then as we move down the layers, 
That's what I'm referring to with where the submucosa is. Sub below mucosa. Because people are like, well, Mr. Q, look at the at the top of the stomach. Um, it says that it says submucosa is below, but that's above it. And I go, okay, cool. But we're using the inside of the stomach as the relative point of reference. Okay. Does that make sense how I describe that? If you're if you have a question, let me know if that makes sense. A check mark will really go a long way to ensure that I, I know that you get that for the most part. And if you're not sure, cool, let me know. I'll, I'll try to explain it a different way. Okay. All right, let's look at our third and final layer, the muscularis, the muscularis layer. So this is our final layer. It's a bigger one in the context of what it does. But again, it's the outside, quote unquote, the outside of the stomach. So it sandwiches the submucosa layer right? It sandwiches the submucosa layer with the mucosa layer, and it's considered the outside of the stomach, okay? So that is our muscularis, muscularis layer. So this is the, the thing that's responsible for mechanical digestion. So it's got, you know, three layers of muscles or three types of muscles that are going to mix all of the things inside the stomach, gastric juices, bolus, and it's going to mix and churn and continue to contract, relax. And the muscularis layer, I say it's got three layers in it, and that's true. But just think of it as it has three different types of muscles that are responsible for really mechanically digesting. You know that stomach sound you make <laughs> after you eat a nice meal and your stomach's like... That's your muscularis layer really going to work, breaking down the further, mechanically digesting further that bolus and mixing it with the gastric juices. Because as we look at gastric juices in just a bit, those gastric juices are going to really be useful later on when digestion really starts to pick up. Okay. So the mixture of the uh, gastric juices with the partially digested food from your mouth or the bolus is called chyme or chime, and it is, for the most part, a liquid. Now, again, for those of you who have ever thrown up before, I'm pretty sure pretty, every single human being on this planet, basically, for whatever reason, uh, if you ever throw up or vomit, it's, for lack of a better word, liquidy. I mean, it can be, depend on what, how soon or relatively recent you ate, but that's actually the chyme. That's that mixture of gastric juices, as well as that food, the most recent meal that you ate, and the, you'll notice it looks a little different <laughs> compared to how it went in. And, and that's because, like I said, that muscularis layer is really going to work to break that stuff up and mix that food with chyme or to mix it with those gastric juices to make chyme. All righty. Questions. Does it make sense? Straightforward. A lot of information. But again, all crucial. All righty. So the last structure I want to talk about with regards to the stomach, and then I'll give you all a second to just take it all in, ask questions, write stuff down, is the pyloric sphincter. So much like the gastroesophageal sphincter, this is a, a muscle ring that's responsible for opening and closing. So the pyloric sphincter keeps the stomach contents from moving too quickly into the small intestine. The stomach it's really important for the stomach to break up all of that food mechanically with those muscularis layers and mix all of those bolus components with gastric juices to make that chyme. Because like I said, we'll look at gastric juices in a second, but the chyme is so important for digestion in the small intestine because in order to properly be digested, it really needs... Hold on a second. It really needs to mix all of that stuff up, okay? It really needs to mix all of that stuff up because without it being mixed up, proper digestion cannot happen. And so the pyloric sphincter keeps everything inside, everything inside of the stomach until it needs to be passed on to the small intestine, okay? 
So five different structures or layers within the stomach. All five have a function and are important. And I promise you all five will be on some assessment at some point in time over the next couple of weeks. So please be mindful of that. Please make sure that you know it. If you have questions about a specific function, a specific layer, let me know. I'm about to talk about gastric juices in just a second. So uh, hang tight if you have a question about gastric juices. Because we'll get there, folks. We'll get there. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. I just closed the lesson down. Left-handed, man. You can't see my screen, but the struggle is real right now, folks. All right, so take a second. Think about... Think about all that stuff. If there's questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on in a couple of minutes. All righty. Uh, is the cardiac sphincter the only thing that can cause heartburn? Yeah, it opens up. It opens up. And if it opens up and any of that chyme or gastric juices get up from the stomach into the esophagus, uh, it, will, it will cause that heartburn. So with it closed, it's pretty much impossible to cause heartburn. And you'll learn a little bit about it in microbiology in undergraduate. But in fact, um, H. pylori is the bacteria. And that bacteria actually grows around that, um, around that sphincter. And it prevents it from closing properly, which then allows that gastric juices to, uh, to get up there. To get up in there. It's pretty fascinating. It's pretty fascinating. All righty. Any other questions about those structures? I'm going to move on to talk about gastric juices in just a second. So I just want to make sure that there are no more other lingering questions about it or about any of the ideas of those structures. Again, right? You're going to have to know those structures. People are like, well, I have to memorize things. I, I hate saying the word memorize. I hate it because if you memorize it, you don't understand the context of it. So instead of trying to memorize it, learn about its function, learn about what it does, learn about why it's important. And if you can think about it in that way, then you won't have to memorize it because you'll just know, right? You'll just know, all right? Because you'll, you'll think about it in the context of importance. You'll think about it in the context of why we need to know it and why it's so important. And if you can do that, then you won't have to necessarily memorize it. And if you're not going to do that or you're unable to do that, then that's where the memorization component can get a little challenging, right? Again, I, I, I don't like saying the word memorize, but. All right, let's take a look at gastric juices. Let's take a look at gastric juices because as I alluded to, there's a lot going on in there that are incredibly important for digestion. The first of the gastric juices is mucus. Mucus, just like the stuff that when you get a sniffly nose, you blow your nose, mucus, same type of mucus exists in your stomach. And it is covered, 
covered in that inner layer. So the inner layer is covered in mucus and it protects that lining. It protects those cells from damage. Now, what's it protecting it from damage from? Well, the mechanical digestion component, it can be quite vigorous. And if you are like me, and if you've ever eaten something like Doritos or chips or something deep fried and crunchy, it still remains, that texture still kind of remains as it's in your stomach. And so as it's being broken down, you know, the mucus helps with that shearing and helps with those, those sharp things, for lack of a better word, that we might ingest. But its main function, its main function oh, is to protect from the strong acid, the hydrochloric acid that exists in our stomachs. Remember, that mucosa layer secretes all that mucus and those enzymes and acids. And the one that it needs to protect itself from, the stomach needs to be protected from, it needs to be protected from that acid. This acid is very important. It has several different functions. First of it is that it kills microorganisms. Did you eat a sketchy uh, street meat meal or eat a sketchy, um, you know, bowl of, uh, or a sketchy tacos at a taco stand? Or did you eat a burrito that maybe wasn't the cleanest burrito on the planet, but it was delicious all the same? Well, thank goodness that strong acid, that hydrochloric acid will kill any microorganisms, both viral and bacterial, that are susceptible to being killed by acid. Sometimes you get, if you ever get food poisoning, it's because that the E. coli strain um, that, you know, that from whatever that wasn't fully cooked or whatever that was not cooked in a clean environment, that E. coli strain is able to withstand strong acids, make its way into your lower intestine and wreak havoc on it. And that's what being, um, uh, that's what food poisoning is. So the first is, if it can, it will kill those microorganisms. And it, really, there are tons of microorganisms that this acid destroys that protect us from getting sick. But the second and arguably more important is the activation of something called pepsin, or pepsin, sorry. So this activation of pepsin, so it activates the pepsin enzyme. This is one of the big things with regards to digestion in the stomach. In the stomach, something called pepsin exists. And this pepsin is responsible for chemically digesting protein. So we've got starches that start to get broken down by amylase. And now, and now we have something that breaks down proteins and that happens in the stomach. So pepsinogen, is activated by the strong acid in the stomach to become pepsin. And pepsin is responsible for chemically breaking down proteins, okay? So if you've ever had a high protein meal, a steak, chicken, pork, uh, a can of uh, baked beans, you know, whatever, bean salad, if you've ever had a high protein meal, it's that pepsin that's activated by the strong acid, that hydrochloric acid, that's responsible for breaking down those proteins. Now, it's important, I have this extra little note here that is sometimes often overlooked, but I wanna spend some time talking a little bit about it, that idea that it's preventing damage by deactivating the enzyme. So the best way to describe pepsinogen, it is delicate, it is delicate. The only way that it is not delicate is in the presence of acid. And the only way that acid is secreted in large quantities in your stomach is just before you smell or you eat a meal. So that first, if you've ever think of like that fond meal, your favorite meal that you've ever had or your favorite meal you've most recently had. And if you're, you know, whoever's cooking, you're at a restaurant, well, not at a restaurant necessarily, but mom's cooking it, dad's cooking it, grandma, grandpa, cousin, aunt, uncle, whatever, brother, sister the smell, the aroma of that meal being cooked not only causes salivation, it actually causes that mucosa layer to secrete those acids that are responsible for activating pepsinogen. And as it activates that pepsinogen, the pepsinogen is kept safe. It's kept safe and, and it's, it's not active. And once the acid is exposed to that pepsinogen, it becomes pepsin, and then you are ready to digest those proteins. So it not only saves energy, but it keeps that protein or those enzymes safe from being broken down normally, okay? All right, questions about gastric juices.
question about gastric juices. All righty. So I'll leave that up there for just a second. You can write down, you can ask questions, give me a check mark or two. All righty. Oh, the smokes. So no questions about any of the gastric juices or? 